The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes uh, reviewing the major things that we talked about last time. Uh, and then uh, get into uh, uh, discrete source coding, which is the major topic for today. Uh, the first major thing that we talked about last time, uh, along with all of, the, uh, all of the philosophy and all those other things, uh, was, was the sense of what digital communication really is. Uh, and I said that what digital communication is, is it's communication where there's a binary interface between source and destination. The source is very often analog. The most interesting sources are analog. The channel is often analog. Most interesting channels are analog. And we'll say more about what I mean by analog later. Uh, what's important is that you have this binary interface uh, between source and channel coding. We said a little bit about why we wanted a binary interface aside from the fact uh, that it's there now. There's nothing you can do about it, even if you don't like it. Uh, one reason is standardization, which means it simplifies implementation, uh, which means you can do everything in the same way. If you have 10 different ch kinds of channel coding and you have 10 different kinds of source coding and you have a binary interface, it means you need to develop 20 different things, 10 at the source, and 10 at the decoder. If you don't have that standardization with a binary interface between them, you need 100 different things. You need to match every kind of source with every kind of destination. Uh, that raises the price of all chips enormously. One of the other things we said is the price of chips is very much the cost of development divided by the number of them that you stamp out. Uh, that's not quite true, but it's a good first approximation. In other words, standardization is important. Layering. Uh, layering is in many ways very, very similar to standardization because this binary interface is also a layer between source and destination. But the idea there is not that it standardizes to make things cheaper, uh, but, it, but it simplifies the conceptualization of what's going on. You can look at a source and only focus on one thing. How do I take that source and turn it into the smallest number of binary digits possible? Uh, and we'll talk a good deal about what that means later because there's something stochastic involved in there and it will take us a while to really understand that. And finally, uh, using a binary interface loses nothing in performance. Uh, that's what Shannon said. It's what he proved. Uh, and, and there are some questions there when you get to networks, uh, but, but the important thing is the places where you want to study uh, non-binary interfaces, you will never get a clue of what it is that you're looking at or why if you don't first very well understand why you want a binary interface to start with. In other words, you look at these other cases as exceptions uh, to, the, to the rule, and if you don't know what the rule is, you certainly can't understand what the exceptions are. Okay, so for today, we're going to start out by studying this part of the problem in here. Namely, how do you turn a source input, a general source input, into binary digits that you're going to put into the channel? How do I study this without studying that? Well, one thing is these are binary digits here. But the other thing is we're going to assume that what binary digits go in here come out here. In other words, there aren't any errors. It's an error-free system. Part of the purpose of studying channel encoding and channel decoding is to say, how is it that you get that error-free performance? You, you can't quite get error-free performance. You get almost error-free performance. Uh, but the idea is when errors come out here, it's not this guy's fault, it's this guy's fault. And therefore, what we're going to study here is how we do our job over here, namely how we deal with decoding the same string of bits that went into there and decode them coming out. Okay, so that's, that's where we'll be. 
uh, for the next uh, three weeks or so. We talked a little bit last time about how do you layer source coding itself. I want to uh, come back because we were talking about so many things last time uh, and, and emphasize what this means a little bit. Uh, uh, we're going to break source coding up into three different layers again. You start out with some kind of input waveform or image or video or whatever the heck it is. You're going to do something like sampling it or expanding it in some kind of expansion. And we'll talk a great deal about that later. That's not an obvious thing, how to do that. When you finish doing that, you wind up with an analog sequence. In other words, you wind up with a sequence of real numbers or a sequence of complex numbers. Those go into a quantizer. Uh, what the quantizer does is to turn an uncountably infinite set of things into a uh, finite set of things. Uh, when you turn an uncountably infinite set of possibilities into a finite set of possibilities, you get distortion. There's no way you can, you can avoid it. So that's a part of what happens there. Then at this point, you have a finite set of, uh, you have a finite alphabet of symbols. That goes into the discrete coder, goes through your, what we're now calling a reliable binary channel, and comes out here. And what we're going to be studying for the next uh, two weeks or so is this piece of the system right in here. Okay, again, what we're going to be doing is assuming a reliable binary channel to the right of this, which is what we already assumed. We're going to assume that these things do whatever they have to. But this problem here, this isolated problem, is important because this is dealing with the entire problem of text. Uh, and you know what text is. It's computer files. Uh, it's English language text. It's Chinese text. It's, uh, it, it, it's whatever kind of text. Uh, and uh, if we understand how to do that, we can then go on to talk about quantization because we'll have some idea of what we're trying to accomplish with quantization. Without that, we won't know what the purpose of quantization is. Uh, and without the quantization, we, know, we won't know what we're trying to accomplish over here. There's another reason for studying this problem, which is that virtually all the ideas that come into this whole bunch of things uh, are all tucked into this one subject in the simplest possible way. One of the nice things about information theory, which we're going to touch on, I said in this course, is that, uh, is that one of the reasons for studying these simple things first uh, is that is that information theory is really like a symphony. You see themes coming out. Those themes get repeated. They get repeated again with more and more complexity each time. And when you understand the simple idea of the theme, then you understand what's going on. So that's the other reason for dealing with that. To summarize those things, most of this I already said. Examples of analog sources are voice, music, video, images. Uh, we're going to restrict this to just waveform sources, which is voice and music. In other words, an image is something where you're mapping from two dimensions, this way and this way, uh, into, into a sequence of binary digits. So it's, so it's a mapping after you get done sampling from R squared, which is this axis and this axis, into, uh, into your output. Namely, for each point in this plane, there's some real number that represents the, uh, the amplitude at that point. Video is a three-dimensional to one-dimensional thing. Namely, you have time. Uh, you also have this way. You have this way. Uh, so you're mapping from R cubed into R. Uh, we're not going to deal with those because really all the ideas are just contained in dealing with waveform sources, in other words, the, con the conventional functions that you're used to seeing, namely things that you can draw on a piece of paper uh, and you can understand what's going on with them. These are usually sampled or expanded into series uh, expansions, uh, almost invariably, and we'll understand why later. Uh, and, and that, in fact, is a major portion of the course. Uh, that's where all of the stuff from signals and systems come in. 
we'll have to expand that a whole lot because you didn't learn enough there. Uh, we need a lot of other things, uh, and that's, that's what we need to deal with waveforms. Uh, we'll take the sequence of numbers that comes out of the sampler. Uh, we're then going to quantize that sequence of numbers. Uh, that's the next thing we're going to study. And then we're going to get into analog and discrete sources, uh, which is the topic we will study uh, right now. So we're going to study this. After we get done this, we're going to study this also. And when we study this, we'll have what we know about this as a way of knowing how to deal with the whole problem from here out to here. Finally, we'll deal with waveforms and deal with the whole problem from here out to here. OK, so that's our, that's our plan. Uh, in fact, this whole course is devoted to studying this problem, then this problem, then this problem. That's the source part of the course. And then dealing with, if I can find it again, with the various parts of this problem. OK, so first we study sources, then we study channels. Because of the binary interface, when we're all done with that, we understand digital communication. Uh, when we get towards the end of the term, we'll be, under, we'll be looking at more sophisticated kinds of channels than we looked at earlier, uh, which are really models for wireless channels. So that's where we're going to end up. OK, so discrete source coding, is, which is what we want to deal with now. What's the objective? We're going to map a sequence of symbols uh, into a binary sequence. And we're going to do it with unique decodability. Uh, and I'm not going to define unique decodability uh, at this point. I'm going to define it a little bit later. But roughly what it means uh, is is this. We have a sequence of symbols which come into the discrete encoder. They go through this binary channel. They come out as a sequence of binary digits. Unique decodability says, if this guy does his job, can this guy do his job? If this guy can always do his job when these digits are correct, then you have something called unique decodability. Namely, uh, you can guarantee that whatever comes out here, whatever comes in here, uh, will turn into a sequence of binary digits. That sequence of binary digits goes through here. These symbols are the same as these symbols. Okay, in other words, you are reproducing things error-free if, in fact, this reproduces things error-free. Okay, so that's our objective. There's a very trivial approach to this. And I hope all of, of you will agree that this is really, in fact, trivial. You map each source symbol into an L tuple of binary digits. Uh, if you have an alphabet of size m, uh, how, many, uh, how many strings are there? How many different binary strings are there of length L? Well, there are two to the L of them. If L is equal to 2, you have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Uh, if L is equal to 3, you have strings of length 3, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and uh, what comes out to be 2 to the 3, which is equal to 8. OK, so what we need, if we're going to use this approach, which is the simplest possible approach, which is called the fixed length approach, uh, is you need the alphabet size to be less than or equal to the number of binary digits that you use in these strings. OK, now, is that trivial or isn't it trivial? I hope it's trivial. Uh, OK. We don't want to waste bits when we're doing this particularly. Uh, so we don't want to make L any bigger than we have to, because for every symbol that comes in, we get L symbols coming out. So we'd like to minimize L subject to this constraint, the 2 to the L has to be bigger, greater than or equal to m. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to choose l as the smallest integer which satisfies this. In other words, when you take the logarithm to the base 2 of this, you get log to the base 2 of m has to be less than or equal to l. And l is then going to be less than log to the base 2 
of m plus one. This is the constraint which says you don't make l any bigger than you have to make it. So in other words, we're going to choose l equal to the ceiling function of log to the base m. In other words, this is the integer uh, which is uh, greater than or equal to uh, log to the base 2 of m. Okay, so let me give you a couple of examples of that. Excuse me for boring you with something which, which really is trivial, but there's notation here you have to get used to. And you get, you get confused with this because there's the alphabet size, which we call m, there's the string length, which we call l, and you keep getting mixed up between these two. Uh, everybody gets mixed up between them. I had a doctoral student the other day uh, who got mixed up in it, and I read what she had written four times, and I didn't catch it either. So, so this does get confusing at times. Okay, if you have an alphabet, which is five different kinds of the letter A, uh, that's one reason why these source codes get messy. You have too many different kinds of each, of each letter, which technical people who like a lot of jargon uh, use all of them, uh, and in fact, when people start writing papers and books, uh, you find many more than five there. Uh, in terms of LaTeX, you get math cal, you get math bold, you get math blah, blah, blah. Uh, everything in little and big. Uh, you get the Greek version, uh, you get the Roman version, uh, and the Arabic version, <laughs> if you're smart enough to know that language, uh, those languages. Uh, and what we mean by a code is alpha gets mapped into 0, 0, 0, a gets mapped into 0, 0, 1, uh, capital A into this, uh, and so forth. Okay. Does it make any difference what mapping you use here? Can you find any possible reason why it wouldn't make a difference whether I map alpha into 0, 0, 0 and a into 0, 0, 1 or vice versa? I can't find any reason for that. Would it make any difference if instead of having this alphabet, I had beta B, capital B, uh, script B, uh, and capital B with a line over it? I can't see any reason why that would make a difference either. In other words, when we're talking about fixed length codes, there are only two things of importance. One of them is how big is the alphabet. That's why we talk about alphabets all the time. Uh, and after you know how big the alphabet is, and after you know you want to do a fixed length binary encoding, uh, then you just assign a binary string to each of these letters. In other words, there's nothing important in these symbols. And this is a very important principle of information theory that sort of under, underlines the whole subject. I'm not really talking about information theory here, as I said, we're talking about communication, but communication these days is built on these information theoretic ideas. Symbols don't have any inherent meaning. As far as communication is concerned, all you're interested in is what is the set of things, I could call this A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, and we're going to start doing this after a while because we will recognize that the name of the symbols don't make any difference. Uh, if you listen to a political speech, if it's by a Republican, there are n different things they might say, and you might as well number them A1 to A sub n. Uh, if you listen to one of the Democratic candidates, uh, there are uh, m different things they might say. You can number them, 1 to m, and you can talk to other people about it and say, oh, he said A1 today, uh, which is how do we get out of the war in, in, in Iraq. Or he said number two today, uh, which is we need more taxes or less taxes, and so forth. Okay, so, so it's not what they say as far as communication is concerned. It's just distinguishing the different possible symbols. Okay, so you can easily decode this. Uh, you see three bits, uh, and you decode them. Can I? Is this right, or is there something, something missing here? Well, of course there's something missing. You need synchronization if you're going to do this. If I see a very long string of binary digits and I'm going to decode them into these letters here, I need to know where the beginning is. In other words, if it's a, a semi-infinite string of binary digits, I don't know how to look at it. So inherently, we believe uh, that somebody else 
gives us synchronization. This is one of these things we always assume. And when you start building a system, after you decide how to do this kind of coding, somebody at some point has to go through and decide where do you get the synchronization from. But you shouldn't think of the synchronization first. If I'm encoding 10 million symbols, and it takes me 1,000 bits to achieve the synchronization, that 1,000 bits gets amortized over 10 million different symbols, and therefore it doesn't make any difference. And therefore, we're going to ignore it. That's an important problem, but we ignore it. OK, the ASCII code is a more important example than this. It was invented many, many years ago. It was a mapping from 256 different symbols, which are all the letters, all the numbers, uh, all the things that people used on typewriters. Anybody remember what a typewriter is? Well, it's something people used to use before they had computers. Uh, and these typewriters had a lot of different keys on them. Uh, and they had a lot of special things you could do with them. And somebody dreamed up 256 different things that they <coughs> might want to do. Why did they use L equals 8? Nothing to do with communication or with information theory or with any of these things. It was that 8 is a nice number. It's 2 to the 3. Uh, in other words, this was a standard length uh, of, of both computer words uh, and of lots of other things. Everybody likes to deal uh, with 8 bits, which you call a byte, uh, rather than 7 bits, which is sort of awkward, or 6 bits, which was an earlier standard, which would have been perfectly adequate for most things that people wanted. Uh, but no, they had to go to 8 bits because uh, it just sounded nicer. OK. These codes are called fixed length codes. Uh, I'd like to say more about them, but there really isn't much, to, much more to say about them. There is a more general version of them, uh, which we'll call generalized fixed length codes. And the idea there is to segment the source sequence. In other words, we're always visualizing now having a sequence of symbols which starts at time zero, runs forever. Uh, we want to se segment that into blocks of length n. Namely, you pick off the first n symbols, you find the code word for those n symbols, then you find the code word for the next n symbols, then you find the code word for the next n symbols, and so forth. So it's really the same problem that we looked at before. It's just that the alphabet before had the number of symbols as the, as the alphabet size. Now, instead of having an alphabet size, which is m, we're looking at, at blocks of m symbols and how many possible combinations are there of blocks uh, where every symbol is one of m different things. Well, if you have two symbols, the first one can be any one of m things. The second one can be any one of m things. So there are m squared possible combination for the first two symbols. There are m cubed possible combinations for the first three symbols, and so forth. So we're going to have an alphabet on blocks of m to the n different n tuples of source letters. OK, well, once you see that, we're done, because what we're going to do is find a binary sequence for every one of these blocks of m to the n symbols. As I said before, the only thing important is how many are there. Doesn't matter that they're blocks, uh, or that they're stacked this way, or that they're stacked around in a circle, or anything else. All you're interested in is how many of them are there. Uh, so they're m to the n of them. Uh, so what we want to do is make the binary length that we're dealing with equal to log to the base 2 of m to the n, the ceiling function of that, which says log to the base 2 of m is less than or equal to L bar, where L bar is going to be the bits per source symbol. I'm going to abbreviate that bits per source symbol. I would like to abbreviate it BPS. Uh, but I and everyone else uh, will keep thinking that BPS means bits per second. We don't have to worry about seconds here. Seconds have nothing to do with this problem. We're just dealing with sequences of things, and we don't care how often they occur. Uh, I mean, they might just, just be sitting in a computer file, and we're doing them offline. So seconds has nothing to do with this problem. Uh, OK, so log to the base 2 of m is less than or equal to uh, 
L over N, which is less than log to the base 2 of M plus 1 over N. In other words, we're just taking, taking uh, this, dividing it by N. We're taking this, dividing it by N. The ceiling function is between log to the base 2 of M to the N and log to the base 2 of M to the N plus 1 when we divide by N, that 1 over that 1 becomes 1 over n. What happens when you make n large? L approaches log to the base 2 of m from above. Therefore, fixed length coding requires uh, log to the base 2 of m uh, bits per source symbol if, in fact, you make n large enough. In other words, for the example of five different kinds of a's, uh, we had m equal to 5. So if you have m equal to 5, That leads to m squared equals 25. That leads to L equals, what's the ceiling function uh, of log of this? It's 5. L bar is equal to, uh, what's half of 5? Two and a half, yes. As you get older, you can't do arithmetic anymore. So look what we've accomplished. We've gone from three bits per symbol down to two and a half bits per symbol. Isn't that exciting? Well, you look at it and you say, no, that's not very exciting. I mean, yes, you can do it, but most people don't do that. So why do we bother with this? Well, it's the same reason we bother with a lot of things in this course. And, and the whole first two weeks of this course will be dealing with things where when you look at them and you ask, is this important, you have to answer, no, it's not important. It doesn't really have much to do with anything. Uh, it's a mathematical idea. Uh, what it does have to do with is the principle involved here is important. It says that the lower limit of what you can do with fixed coding is log to the base 2 of m. When you have an alphabet of size m, you can get as close to this as you want to. We will find out later uh, that if you have equally likely symbols when we get to talking about probability, we will find out that nothing in the world can do any better than this. And that's the more important thing because what we're eventually interested in is what's the best you can do if you do things very complicated. Why do you want to know what the best is if you do something very complicated? Because if you can do that simply, then you know you don't have to look any further. Okay, so that's the important thing. Namely, it lets you do something simple and know that in fact what you're doing makes sense. That's why we do all of that. But then after we say, well, there's no place else to go on fixed length codes, uh, we say, well, let's look at variable length codes. And the motivation for variable length codes uh, is that probable symbols should probably have shorter code words uh, than very unlikely symbols. Uh, and Morse thought of this a long, long time ago when Morse code came along. Probably other people thought of it earlier, uh, but, he, uh, but he actually developed the system uh, and it worked. Uh, and everyone since then uh, has understood uh, that if you have a symbol that only occurs very, very, very rarely, uh, you would like to do something, make a code word which is very long for it so it doesn't interfere with other code words. Uh, namely, one of the things that you often do when you're developing a code is think of a whole bunch of things which are sort of exceptions. They hardly ever happen. And you use a fixed length code for all the things that happen all the time, and you make one extra code word for all these exceptions. And then you have this exception, and pasted on at the end of the exception is a, is a number which represents which exception you're looking at. OK, presto, you have a variable length code. Namely, you have two different possible code lengths, one of them for all of the likely things and the indication that there is an exception, and two, all the unlikely things. There's an important feature there. You can't drop out having the code words saying this is an exception. If you just have a bunch of short code words, 
and a bunch of long code words, then you see a short code word and you don't know. Uh, well, if you see a long code word starting or you have a short code word, you don't know which it is and you're stuck. Okay, so one example of a variable length code. We'll use some, uh, we'll use some jargon here. Uh, we'll call the code uh, uh, script C. We'll think of script C as a mapping which goes from the symbols onto binary strings. Uh, in other words, C of X uh, is the code word corresponding to the symbol X. So for each X in the alphabet capital X, uh, we have to think of what the capital X is. But as, as we say, the only thing we're really interested in is how big is this alphabet. That, that's the only thing of importance. Uh, so if we have an alphabet which consists of the three letters A, B, and C, uh, we might make a code where the code word for A is equal to zero, the code word for B is equal to one zero, and the code word for C is equal to one one. Now it turns out that's a perfectly fine code and that works. Uh, let me show you another example of a code. Uh, well, let me just uh, show you an example of a code here. So we can see that not everything works. Suppose C of A is 0, C of B is 1, and C of C is, this is a script C, that's a little c, uh, is 1, 0. Does that work? Well, all of the symbols have different code words. But this is an incredibly stupid thing to do. And it's an incredibly stupid thing to do because uh, if I send a B followed by an A, uh, what the poor decoder sees is one followed by zero. In other words, one of the things that I didn't tell you about is when we're using variable length codes, we're just concatenating all of these code words together. We don't put any spaces between them. We don't put any commas between them. If in fact I put a space between them, I would really have not a binary alphabet, but a ternary alphabet. I would have zeros and I would have ones and I would have spaces. And you don't like to do that because it's much harder. When we start to study channels, we'll see that ternary alphabets are much more difficult to work with than binary alphabets. So this doesn't work. This does work. And part of what we're going to be interested in is what are the conditions under why this works and why this doesn't work. Again, when you understand this problem, you will say it's very simple. And then you come back to look at it again, and you'll say it's complicated. And then it looks simple. Uh, it's one of these problems that looks simple when you look at it in the right way, and it looks complicated. Uh, when you get turned around and you look at it backwards. Okay, so the successive code words of a variable length code uh, are all transmitted just as a continuing sequence of bits. You don't have any of these commas or spaces in them. I have a sequence of symbols which come into the encoder. Those get mapped into a sequence of bits, uh, variable length sequences of bits which come out. They all get pushed together uh, and just come out one after the other. Uh, buffering can be a problem here because when you have a variable length code, I mean, look at what happens here. If I get a very long string of A's coming in, I got a very short string of bits coming out. If I have a long string of B's and C's coming in, I have a very long string of bits coming out. Now, usually the way the channels work uh, is that you put in bits uh, at a fixed rate in time. And usually the way that sources work is that symbols uh, arrive at a fixed rate in time. And therefore here, if symbols are coming in at a fixed rate in time, they're going out at a non-fixed rate in time. Uh, we have to bring them into a channel at a fixed rate in time. So we need a buffer to take care of the difference between the rate at which they come out and the rate at which they go in. We will talk about that problem later, uh, but for now we just say, okay, we have a buffer. We'll put them all in a buffer. If the buffer ever empties out, 
Uh, well, that's sort of like the problem of initial synchronization, something that doesn't happen very often. Uh, and we'll put some junior engineer on that because it's a hard problem. And senior engineers never deal with the hard problems. They always give those to the junior engineers so that they can assert their superiority over the junior engineers. It's a, it's a standard thing to find in the industry. OK, we also require unique decodability. Namely, the encoded bit stream uh, has to be uniquely parsed at the decoder, I have to have some way of taking that long string of bits and figuring out where the commas would have gone if I put commas in it. And then from that, I have to decode things. In other words, it means that every symbol in the alphabet has to have a distinct code word connected with it. We have that here. We have that here. Every symbol has a distinct code word. But it has to be more than that. And I'm not even going to talk about precisely what that more means uh, for a little bit. Uh, we also assume to make life easy for the decoder uh, that it has initial synchronization. There's another obvious property that we have, namely both the encoder and the decoder know what the code is to start with. Uh, in other words, the code is built into these devices. When you design a coder and a decoder, uh, what you're doing is you figure out what an appropriate code should be. You give it to both the encoder and the decoder. Both of them know what the code is, and therefore both of them can start decoding. Piece of confusion. We have an alphabet here which has a list of symbols in it. So there's a symbol A1, A2, A3, up to A sub M. We're sending a sequence of symbols. And we usually call the sequence of symbols we're sending x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and so forth. The, the difference is the symbols in the alphabet are all distinct. We're listing them one after the other. Usually there's a finite number of them. Incidentally, we could have a countable number of, of symbols. You could try to do everything we're doing here, uh, say, with the, uh, say, with the integers. And there's a countable number of integers. All of this theory pretty much carries through with various little complications. We're leaving that out here because after you understand what we're doing, <coughs> making it apply to integers is straightforward. Putting in the integers to start with, you'll always be fussing about various silly little special cases. And I don't know a single situation where anybody deals with a countable alphabet, except by truncating it. And when you truncate a an infinite alphabet, you get a finite alphabet. So, uh, so we'll assume initial synchronization. We'll also assume that there's a finite alphabet. And you should always make sure that you know whether you're talking about a listing of the symbols in the alphabet or a listing of the symbols in a sequence. The symbols in a sequence can all be the same. They can all be different. Uh, they can be anything at all. And the listing of symbols in the alphabet there's just one for each symbol. OK, we're going to talk about a very simple case of uniquely decodable codes, which are called prefix-free codes. Uh, and a code is prefix-free if no code word is a prefix of any other code word. In other words, a code word is a string of binary digits, a prefix of a string of binary digits. <coughs> For example, if we have the binary string 10111, what are the prefixes of that? Well, one prefix is prefixes. One, zero, one, one. Another one is one, zero, one. Another one is one, zero. Another is one. In other words, it's the what you get by starting out at the beginning and not quite getting to the end. All of these things are called prefixes. Uh, if you want to be general, you could call 10111 a prefix of itself. Uh, we won't bother to do that because it just is. That's the kind of things that mathematicians do to save a few words and the proofs that they give. And we won't bother with that. Uh, we will rely a little more on common sense. Incidentally, we 
I prove a lot of things in these notes here. Uh, I will ask you to prove a lot of things. Uh, and one of the questions that people always have is, 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 is what does a proof really mean? I mean, what is a proof and what isn't a proof? Uh, and when you take mathematics courses, uh, you get one idea of what a proof is, uh, which is appropriate for mathematics courses. Namely, you prove things using the correct terminology for proving them. Namely, everything that you deal with, uh, you define it ahead of time so that all, all of the terminology you're using all has correct definitions. Uh, and then everything should follow from those definitions. And you should be able to follow a proof through without any insight at all about what is going on. You should be able to follow a mathematical proof step by step without knowing anything about what this is going to be used for, why anybody is interested in it, or anything else. And that's an important thing to learn. That's not what we're interested in here. What we're interested in here for a proof, I mean, yes, you know all of the things around this particular proof that we're dealing with. And what you're trying to do is to construct a proof that covers all possible cases. And you're going to use insight for that. You're going to use common sense. You're going to use whatever you have to use. Uh, and, and eventually, you start to, in, start to get some, some sort of second sense about when you're leaving something out that really should be there. Uh, and that's what we're going to be focusing on when we worry about trying to be precise here. And when I start proving things about prefix codes, I think you'll see this because you will look at it and say that's not a proof. Uh, and in fact, it really is a proof. Uh, any good mathematician would look at it and say, yes, that is a proof. Uh, bad mathematicians sometimes look at it and say, well, it doesn't look like a proof, so it can't be a proof. But, uh, but they are. OK, so here we have prefix-free codes. The definition is no code word is a prefix of any other code word. If you have a prefix-free code, you can express it in terms of a binary tree. Now, a binary tree starts at a root. This is the beginning. Uh, moves off to the right. You might have it start at the bottom and move up. Uh, or whatever direction you want it to go in. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, and if you take the zero path, you come to some leaf. If you take the one path, you come to some intermediate node here. Uh, from the intermediate node, uh, you either go up or you go down. Namely, you have a one or a zero. Uh, from this intermediate node, you go up and you go down. In other words, a binary tree, every node in it is either an intermediate node, which means there are two branches going out from it, or it's a leaf, which means there aren't any branches going out up from it. You can't, in a binary tree, have just one branch coming out of a node. There are either no branches or two branches, just by definition of what we mean by a binary tree. Uh, binary says two. Okay. So here, this tree corresponds where, where we label uh, various ones of the leaves, it corresponds to the, tr to the code where A corresponds to the uh, string 0, B corresponds to the string 1, 1, and C corresponds to the string 1, 0, 1. Now, you look at this, and when you look at the tree, I mean, when you look at this as a code, uh, it's not obvious that it's something really stupid about it. Uh, when you look at the tree, it's pretty obvious that there's something stupid about it uh, because here we have this, here we have this C here, uh, which is sitting off on this leaf, and here we have this leaf here, which isn't doing anything for us at all. And we say, gee, we could still keep this prefix condition if we move this into here and we drop this off. Okay, So any time that there's something hanging here without corresponding to a symbol, uh, you would really like to shorten it. And when you shorten these things uh, and you can't shorten anything else, namely when every leaf has a symbol on it, you call it a full tree. Uh, so a full tree is more than a tree. A full tree is a code tree where the leaves correspond to symbols. Okay, So a full tree has no empty leaves. Empty leaves can be shortened, just like I showed you here 
Uh, so we'll talk about full trees, and full trees are sort of the good trees, but prefix can, prefix free codes don't necessarily uh, have to worry about that. Okay, well now I'm going to prove something to you, uh, and uh, at this point you really should object, uh, but I don't care. Uh, we will come back and you'll get straightened out on it later. I'm going to prove that prefix free codes are uniquely decodable, uh, and uh, and you should cry foul because I really haven't defined what uniquely decodable means yet. Uh, and, and, and you think you know what uniquely decodable means, which is good. Uh, it means physically that you can look at a string of code words and you can pick out what all of them are. Uh, we will define it later and you'll find out it's not that simple. Uh, and as we move on, when we start talking about Lempel ziv codes and things like that, you will start to really wonder what unique decodable means. Uh, so it's not quite as simple as it looks. But anyway, let's, let's prove that prefix-free codes are uniquely decodable anyway, uh, because prefix-free codes are a particularly simple example of uniquely decodable codes, and it's sort of clear that you can, in fact, decode them because of one of the properties that they have. Okay, and the way we're going to prove this is we want to look at a sequence of symbols or a string of symbols that come out of the source. And as that string of symbols come out of the source, each symbol in the string gets mapped into a binary string, and then we concatenate all those binary strings together. Uh, that, that's a big mouthful. So let's look at this code we were just talking about where the code words are B, C, and A. So if a one comes out of the source uh, and then another one, it corresponds to the first letter B. If a one zero comes out, it corresponds to the first letter C. If a zero comes out, it corresponds to the letter A. Well, now the second symbol comes in. Uh, and what happens on that second symbol is if the first symbol was an A, the second symbol could be a, a B or a C or an A, which gives rise to this little subtree here. If the first letter is a B, the second letter could be either an A, B, or a C, which gives rise to this little subtree here. And if we have a C followed by anything, that gives rise to this little subtree here. And you can imagine growing this tree as far as you want to, although it gets hard to write down. How do you decode this? Well, as many things, you want to start at the beginning. And we have, and we know where the beginning is. That's a basic assumption on all of this source coding. So knowing where the beginning is, you sit there and you look at it. And you see a zero is the first letter, uh, is the first binary digit, and zero says, I move this way in the tree, and presto, I say, gee, an A must have been sent as the, must have occurred as the first source letter. So what do I do? I remove the A, I print out A, and then uh, I start to look at this point. At this point, I'm back where I started at, so if I can decode the first letter, I can certainly decode everything else. Okay, if the first letter is a B, what I see is a one, followed by a one, namely when I see the first binary one come out of the, uh, uh, of the channel, I don't know what was sent. I know either a B or a C was sent. I have to look at the second letter. The second, the second binary digit resolves my confusion. I know that the first source letter was then a B, if it's one one, or a C, if it's one zero. I decode that first source letter and then, where am I? I'm either on this tree or on this tree, each of which goes extending off into the wild blue yonder. So this says, uh, if I know where the beginning is, I can decode the first letter. But if I, can be, if I can decode the first letter, I know where the beginning is for everything else. Uh, and therefore, I can decode that also. Okay, well, aside from any small amount of confusion about what uniquely decodable means, uh, that's a perfectly fine mathematical proof. So, prefix-free codes are, in fact, uniquely decodable. 
and that's nice. So then there's a question. What, what is the condition on the lengths of a prefix-free code uh, which allow you to have unique decodability? And the craft inequality is a test on whether there are prefix-free codes or there are not prefix-free codes uh, uh, connected with any given set of code word lengths. <coughs> this is a very interesting inequality. Uh, this is one of the relatively few things in information theory that was not invented by Claude Shannon. And you sit there and you wonder, why didn't, why didn't Claude Shannon realize this? Well, it's because he was, I think he sort of realized that it was trivial. Uh, he sort of understood it, and he was really eager to get on to the meat of things, uh, which is unusual for him because he was somebody more than anyone else I know uh, who really understood why you should understand the simple things before you go on to the more complicated things. But anyway, he missed this. Uh, Bob Fano, who some of you might know, who was a professor emeritus uh, over in LCS, uh, was interested in information theory then. He was teaching a graduate course back in the 50s here at MIT. Uh, and uh, uh, as he often did, he threw out these problems and said, nobody, nobody knows how to figure this out. How, what, what kinds of lengths can you have on prefix-free codes and what kinds of lengths can't you have? Uh, and Kraft was a graduate student at the time. Uh, and the next day, he came in with this beautiful, elegant proof. Uh, and uh, everybody's always known who Kraft is. Ever since then, nobody's ever known what he did after that. Uh, but at least he made his mark on the world as a graduate student. So, uh, so in a sense, those were good days to be around uh, uh, because all the obvious things hadn't been done yet. <laughs> but the other thing is you never know what the obvious things are until you do them. This didn't look like an obvious problem ahead of time. And we'll talk about a number of other obvious things that got solved because somebody was looking at it in a slightly different way uh, than other people were looking at it. You see, back then, people said, we want to look at these variable length codes because uh, we want to have some capability of mapping improbable uh, symbols into long code words and probable symbols into short code words. And you'll notice that I've done something strange here. That was our motivation for looking at variable length codes. But I haven't said a thing about probability. All I'm dealing with now is the question of what is possible and what is not possible. And we'll bring in probability later, but now all we're trying to figure out is what are the sets of code word lengths you can use and what are the sets of code word lengths you can't use. Okay, so what Kraft said is every prefix-free code for an alphabet X with code word lengths L of X uh, for each letter in the alphabet X satisfies the sum 2 to the minus length less than or equal to 1. In other words, you take all of the code words in the alphabet, you take the length of each of those code words, you take 2 to the minus L of that length, uh, and if this inequality is not satisfied, your code does not satisfy the prefix condition. Uh, there's no way you can create a prefix-free code uh, which has these lengths, uh, so you're out of luck. So you better create a new set of lengths which satisfies this inequality. And there's also a simple procedure you can go through which lets you construct a code which has these lengths. So in other words, this in a sense is a necessary and sufficient condition on the, on the possibility of constructing codes with a particular set of lengths. It has nothing to do with probability. Uh, so it's, so it's, in a sense, cleaner than these other results. And uh, so, conversely, if this inequality is satisfied, you can construct a prefix-free code. And even more strangely, you can construct it very, very easily, as we'll see. And finally, a prefix-free code is full. You remember what a full prefix-free code is? It's a code where the tree has, has nothing that's unused, if and only if this inequality is satisfied with equality. <laughs>
So it's a neat result. Uh, and it's useful in a lot of places other than uh, source coding. Uh, if you ever get involved with designing protocols for computer networks or protocols for, for any kind of computer communication, uh, you'll find that you use this all the time because this says you can do some things, you can't do other things. OK, so let's see why it's true. Give you another funny proof that doesn't look like a proof, but it really is. What I'm going to do is to associate code words with uh, base 2 expansions. There's a little genie that early in the morning leaves things out as these uh, slides when I make them. And it wasn't me, I put it in. Uh, so we're going to prove this by associating code words with base 2 expansions, uh, which are like decimals, but decimals to the base 2. In other words, we're going to take a code word, uh, y1, y2, up to y sub m, where y1 is a binary digit, y2 is a binary digit. This is a string of binary digits. And we're going to represent this as a real number. And the real number is the decimal, but it's not a decimal. It's, it's, a, it, it, it's a decimal, if you will, uh, which is uh, dot y1, y2, up to y sub m, which means y1 over 2 plus y2 over 4 plus dot, 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 plus y sub m over 2 to the minus m. If you think of it, an ordinary decim decimal, uh, y1, y2, up to y sub m, means y1 over 10 plus y2 over 100 plus y3 over 1,000 and so forth. So this is, this is what people would have developed for decimals uh, if, in fact, we lived in a, uh, in a base 2 world instead of a base 10 world. Uh, if you were born without fingers, and you only had two fingers, uh, this is the number system you would use, OK? OK, when we think about decimals, there's something more involved. We use decimals all the time to approximate things. Namely, if I say uh, that a number is 0.12, uh, I don't mean usually that it's exactly 12 one hundredths. Uh, usually, I mean it's about 12 one hundredths. Uh, and the easiest way to do this is to round things down to two decimal points. In other words, when I say 0.12, what I really mean is I am talking about a real number which lies between 12 one hundredths and 13 one hundredths. It's greater than or equal to 12 one hundredths, and it's less than 13 one hundredths. And I'll do the same thing in base 2. And as soon as I do this, you'll see where the craft inequality comes from, OK? OK, so I'm going to have this interval here, which the interval associated with a, with a binary expansion to m digits. There's a number associated with it, which is this number here. Uh, and there's also an interval associated with it, which is 2 to the minus m. So if I have a, uh, if I have a code consisting of 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, uh, what I'm going to do is represent 0, 0 as a binary expansion. So 0, 0 is a binary expansion as 0, 0, which is 0. But also as an approximation, it's between 0 and 1 quarter. So I have this interval associated with 0, 0, which is the interval uh, from 0 up to 1 fourth. For the code word 0, 1, I'm trying to see whether that is part of a prefix code. Uh, I, have the, I map it into a number, 0 0.01, as a binary expansion. This number uh, corresponds to the number 1 quarter. Uh, and it also corresponds, since it's of length 2, to an interval of size 1 quarter. So we go from uh, 1 quarter up to 1 half. Uh, and finally, I have 1, uh, which is uh, corresponds to the number 1 half. And since it's only one binary digit long, it corresponds to the interval 1 half to 1. Namely, if I truncate things to one binary digit, uh, I'm talking about the entire interval from 1 half to 1. OK? OK, so where does the, where does the craft inequality come from, and what does it have to do with this? Incidentally, this isn't the way the craft proved it. Uh, 
I mean, Kraft was very smart. Uh, he did this as his master's thesis, too, I believe. Uh, and, uh, and since he wanted it to be his master's thesis, he didn't want to make it qu look quite that trivial, or Bob Fano would have said, oh, you ought to do something else for a master's thesis also. So, uh, so he was cagey and made his proof look a little more complicated. Okay, so if a code word X is a prefix of code word Y, in other words, Y uh, has some binary expansion. X has some binary expansion, which is the first, uh, first few letters of Y. Then the number corresponding to X and the interval corresponding to X, namely X covers that entire range of decimal expansions, which start with X and goes up to something which differs from X only in that nth binary digit. Okay? Uh, in other words, let me, let me show you what that means in terms of here. If I try to create a code word 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 would correspond to the number 1 16th. And 1 16th lies in that interval there. Okay, in other words, any time I create a code word which lies in the interval corresponding to another code word, it means that uh, this code word has a prefix of that code word. And sure enough, it does, 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, this has this as a prefix. In other words, there is a perfect mapping between intervals associated with code words and, uh, and prefixes of, of, of code words. So in other words, uh, if we have a prefix-free code, the intervals for each of these code words has to be distinct. Well, now we're in nice, in nice shape because we know what the size of each of these intervals is. The size of the interval associated with a code word of length 2 uh, is 2 to the minus 2. And to be a prefix-free code, all these intervals have to be disjoint. But everything is contained here between 0 and 1. And therefore, when we add up all of these intervals, we get a number which is at most 1. Okay? That's the craft inequality. That's, that's all there is to it. Uh, there was one more thing in it. It's a full code uh, if and only if the craft inequality is satisfied with equality. And where was that? Now, the code is full if and only if the expansion intervals fill up 0 and 1. In other words, if you, uh, I mean, suppose you had, uh, this was 1, 0, which would lead into 0.1 with an interval uh, 1 half to 3 quarters, and this was all you had, then this interval up here would be empty, and in fact, since this interval is empty, you could shorten the code down. Okay? In other words, you'd have intervals which weren't full, uh, which <coughs> means that you would have code words that could be put in there which are not there. So that, that completes the proof. So now, finally, it's time to define unique decodability. And the definition in the notes is a mouthful. Uh, so I broke it apart into a bunch of different pieces here. Uh, a code C for a discrete source is uniquely decodable if for each string of source letters, x1 up to x sub m, these are not distinct letters of the alphabet. These are just the things that might come out of the source. X1 could be the same as X2. It could be different from X2. If all of these letters coming out of the source, that corresponds to some, uh, to some concatenation of these code words, namely C of X1, C of X2, up to C of X sub n. Uh, so I have this coming out of the source, this is a string of binary digits that come out corresponding to this. 
And I require that this differs from the concatenation of the code words C of X1 prime up to C of Xm prime for any other string X1 prime, X2 prime, X sub M prime of source letters. Example of this, uh, the thing that we were trying to construct before, uh, C of A equals uh, 1, C of B equals 0, C of C equals 1, 0. Doesn't work because the concatenation of A and B yields 1, 0, C of x1, uh, take x1 to be A, take x2 to be B. This concatenation, C of x1, C of x2, uh, is C of A, C of B equals 1, 0. C of C equals 1, 0. And therefore, you don't have something that works. Note that N here can be different from M here. And you'll deal with that in the homework in a little bit, not, not, not this week's set. Uh, but that's, that's what unique decodability says. Uh, let me give you an example. Ah, here's an example. Turns out that all uniquely decodable codes have to satisfy the Kraft inequality also. Uh, Kraft didn't prove this. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a bit of a bear to prove it. Uh, and we'll prove it later. And I suspect that about two thirds of you will see the proof and say, Bleh. and one third of you will say, oh, this is really, really interesting. Uh, I, th I sort of say, gee, this is interesting sometimes. And more often I say, Bleh. why do we have to do this? Uh, but, but one example of a code which is uniquely decodable uh, is first code word is one. Second code word is 1, 0. Third is 1, 0, 0. And the fourth is 1, 0, 0, 0. It doesn't satisfy the Kraft inequality with equality. It satisfies it with inequality. It is uniquely decodable. How do I know it's uniquely decodable? By just looking at it? Because any time I see a 1, I know it's the beginning of a code word. So I look at some long binary string. It starts out with a 1. I just read digits until it comes to the next one. I say, aha, that next one is the first binary digit in the second code word. The third one that I see is the first digit in the third code word, and so forth. You might say, why don't I make the one the end of the code word instead of the beginning of the code word, and then we'll have the prefix condition again. Uh, and, and all I can say is, because I want to be preferred because I want to be perverse and I want to give you an example of something uh, that is uniquely decodable but doesn't satisfy the Kraft inequality. There's a question, why don't we just stick to prefix-free codes and forget about unique decodability? Uh, you won't understand the answer to that really until we start looking at things like lempel ziv codes, which are in fact a bunch of different things all put together. Uh, which are in fact very, very practical codes. Uh, and, but they're not prefix-free codes, and you'll see why they're not prefix-free codes when we study them. Uh, and then you will see why we want to have a definition of something which is more involved than that. So don't worry about that for the time being. For the time being, the correct idea to take away from this uh, is that uh, why not just use prefix-free codes and the answer is, for quite a while, we will. Uh, and we know that anything we can do with prefix-free codes, we can also do with uniquely decodable codes. Anything we can do with uniquely decodable codes, we can do with prefix-free codes. Namely, any old code that you invent has a certain set of lengths associated uh, uh, with the code words. And if it satisfies the Kraft inequality, you can easily develop a prefix-free code which has those lengths. And you might as well do it, because then it makes decoding a lot easier. Namely, if we have a prefix-free code, let, let's go back and look at that, because I never mentioned it, and it really is one of the 
important advantages of prefix-free codes. When I look at this picture and I look at the proof of how I saw that this was uniquely decodable, what we said was you start at the beginning and as soon as the decoder sees the last binary digit of a code word, the decoder can say, aha, it's that code word. So it's instantaneously decodable. In other words, all you need to see is the end of the code word, and at that point, you know it's the end. And incidentally, that makes figuring out when you have a long sequence of code words and you want to stop the whole thing, it makes things a little bit easier. This example we started out with of, uh, yeah, I can't find it anymore, uh, but the example of a, of a uniquely decodable but non-prefix-free code, you always had to look at the first digit of the next code word to know that the old code word was finished. So, uh, so prefix-free codes have that advantage also. Okay, the next topic that we're going to take up is discrete memoryless sources. Namely, at this point, we have gone as far as we can in studying prefix-free codes and uniquely decodable codes strictly in terms of their non-probabilistic properties, namely the question of what set of lengths can you use in a prefix-free code or a uniquely decodable code and what sets of lengths can't you use. So the next thing we want to do uh, is to start looking at the probabilities of these different symbols and looking at the probabilities of the different symbols, we want to find out what sort of lengths we want to choose. Uh, and that will be, uh, there will be a simple answer to that. Uh, in fact, there will be two ways of looking at it, one of which will lead to the idea of entropy and the other of which will lead to the idea of generating an optimal code. And both of those approaches are extremely interesting. But to do that, we have to think about a very simple kind of source. And the simple kind of source is called a discrete memoryless source. We know what a discrete source is. It's a source which spews out a, a sequence of symbols from this finite alphabet that we know and the decoder knows. Uh, and uh, the, the next thing we have to do is to put a probability measure on the output of the source. Uh, there's a little uh, review of probability at the end of this lecture. Uh, you should read it carefully. Uh, when you study probability, you have undoubtedly studied it, like most students do, uh, as, a, uh, as a way of learning how to do the problems. Uh, and you don't necessarily think of the, of the generalizations of this uh, you don't necessarily think of why is it that when you define a probability space, you start out with a sample space uh, and you talk about elements in the sample space, which are sample points, and, and what do those sample points have to do with random variables and all of that stuff? Uh, and that's the first thing you forget uh, when you haven't been looking at probability for a while. Uh, so, uh, and unfortunately, it's something you have to understand when we're dealing with this because we have a bunch of things which are not random variables here. These, these letters here are things we, which we will call chance variables. A chance variable is just like a random variable, but the set of possible values that it has are not necessarily numbers. Uh, they're, just, uh, they're just events, as it turns out. So the, so the sample space is just some set of letters, as we call them, which are really events in this probability space. The probability space assigns probabilities to sequences of letters. And what we're assuming here is that this sequence of letters are all statistically independent of each other. Uh, so that, for example, uh, if you were sitting at a, uh, if, if you go to Las Vegas uh, and you're reporting the outcome of some gambling game, uh, and you're sending it back to your home computer, and your home computer is figuring out what your odds are in blackjack or something, uh, then every time the dice are rolled, you get an independent, uh, we hope it's independent if the game is fair, uh, uh, outcome of the dice. Uh, and 
Uh, so that what we're sending then, what we're going to encode, is a sequence of independent random, not random variables because it's not necessarily numbers that you're interested in. Uh, it's this sequence of symbols. <coughs> But if we deal with the English alphabet, for example, if, if we deal with, with English text, for example, the idea that the letters in English text are independent of each other is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, if, if it's early enough in the term that you're not overloaded already, uh, I would suggest that those of you with little time go back and read uh, at least the first part of Shannon's original article about information theory, uh, where he talks about the problem of modeling English. And it's a beautiful treatment, because he starts out, same way we are, uh, dealing with sources which are independent, identically distributed chance variables. Then he goes from there, as we will, uh, to looking at, at, at Markov chains uh, of, uh, of source variables. And some of you will cringe at this because uh, you might have seen Markov chains and forgotten about them, or you might have never seen them. Uh, don't worry about it. There's not that much that's peculiar about them. And then he goes on from there to talk about actual English language. And, but, but the point that he makes is that when you want to study something as complicated as the English language, the way that you do it is not to start out by taking a lot of statistics about English. Uh, if you want to encode English, you start out by making highly simplifying assumptions, like the assumption that we're making here that we're dealing with a discrete memoryless source. Uh, you then learn how to encode discrete memoryless sources. You then look at blocks of letters out of these sources. Uh, and if they're not independent, you look at the probabilities of these blocks. And if you know how to generate an optimal code, for uh, IID letters, then all you have to do is take these blocks of length m, where you have a probability on each possible block, uh, and you generate a code for the block. And you don't worry about the st statistical relationships between different blocks. You just say, well, if I make my block long enough, I don't care about what happens at the edges. Uh, and I'm going to get everything of interest. Okay. So the idea is, by starting out here, uh, you have all the clues you need to start looking at the more interesting cases. As it turns out, with source coding, there's another advantage involved. Looking at independent letters is, in some sense, a worst case. And when you look at this worst case, uh, in fact, presto, uh, you will say, if the letters are statistically related, fine. Uh, I do even better. Uh, I could do better if I took that into account, but if I'm not taking it into account, I know exactly how well I can do. Okay, so what's the definition of that? Source output is an unending sequence, x1, x2, x3, of randomly selected letters, uh, and these randomly selected letters are called chance variables. Uh, each source output is selected from the alphabet using a common probability measure. In other words, they're identically distributed. Uh, and each source output is statistically independent of the other source outputs, x1 up to xk plus 1. And we will call that uh, independent, identically distributed, and we'll abbreviate it IID. Uh, it, doesn't mean that, uh, it doesn't mean that the probability measure is 1 over m for each letter. It's not what we were assuming before. Uh, it means you can have an arbitrary probability assignment on the different letters, but every letter has the same probability assignment on it, uh, and they're all independent of each other. Uh, so that's the kind of source we're going to be dealing with first, and we will find out everything we want to know about how we deal with that source. And you will understand that source completely, and the other sources you will, you will half understand a little later. Thanks.